Welcome to day three. We are live with Meet the Authors. Uh, the last two days have been absolutely fantastic. I'm Mary Alice Curran. I'm here with my colleague, Jamie Donnelly. We're just running the tech in the background, but we cannot wait. Today, um, the authors are gonna be sharing their writing process. So I'm gonna go in the background um, and be gathering any questions that are coming live on YouTube. Jamie, do you have anything technically that we should be sharing. I'm gonna go mute and dark. Yeah, it's going well so far. Everybody's been able to um, join in and have a conversation with the authors. Questions will be asked here at the end, so feel free to add them. Uh, we'll be posting their websites also on YouTube, so definitely check them out. Uh, they have so many other resources that they're not able to share during the live feed, so certainly check those out. And I think we're ready to let the guys take over. Okay. My well, let me let me just start and say this is the, this is the day I look forward to before we get to Jack. I, I love 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 hearing authors talk about how they write books, and even though I write books, uh, I'm really really interested in how people write books. There's a lot of different ways to write a story or a book, and and this is really going to be fun for me. But I think Jack, you're beginning, right? Um, I thought you were. I thought you were kicking it off. But do you want me? No, to you are. No. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, no. You're going last. Jerry, you're starting. Yeah. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah, you guys are teasing me. I'm going to go first. I'm the picture book guy. Then we'll build up to you novel guys. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you know what? When I first started visiting schools 30 years ago, after one of my talks, the principal said, why don't you tell the kids your process of writing books? And I thought about it, and I had never really thought about my process of writing books. But before I show you the process, kids, teachers... Here's how the books are printed. They're printed on a giant sheet like that. So see, there's a quarter of the book. There's another quarter. I'm not going to show you the other two quarters. But the book is 32 pages long. So I'm a 32-page color picture book guy. That's who I am. Okay? So uh, by the way, teachers, they fold it, then they fold it, then they fold it, then they fold it. And there's half the book right there. Usually they do the whole book at once. But this printer did it in two pieces. I didn't want to waste our time folding the other one on the show. But look, there's half the book. Here's half the book. There's LM. I'm an alphabet book guy when I started out. And look, there's the whole book right there. So what's missing? See what it looks like? What's missing? The cover. They glue the cover on. They staple it. The last thing they do is trim it. So my books are 32 pages long. So when I was writing my books, that's what I do. That's how I would start. Like, that's my writing process. Actually, to start a book was in my head. So it's in my head. Like, what was I thinking of? Recently, I wrote a book called Ultimate Shark Rumble. I'm going to show that in a couple minutes. But when I first started writing, I thought, I'm going to write a book about the ocean, A through Z, you know, fish, A through Z. I wanted to write... Um, a book full of facts that kids could read all about different fish. So that was the idea in my head. And then I thought, could I do this? So most of the time I could do it. Like I wrote a book of birds, I found a bird for every letter. I wrote a book of bugs, I found a bug for every letter. I wrote a book of flowers. Sometimes I couldn't finish the book. So here's, a, here's a, you kids out there, here's a book I started, I worked on it, but I couldn't finish it. I tried to find the baby name of every, of a book of animal baby names, like a baby cat is a kitten, so K is for kitten. A baby dog is a puppy, P is for puppy, you know? And I kept going and going. Some of them were funny. A baby pu a baby echidna, which is an a anteater, no, a, um, whatever it is, I'm trying to think, is a puggle. And a baby elephant seal is a wiener. So I had almost every letter, but when I really looked at it, I was missing like six or seven letters I couldn't do the book, I gave it up. But that's when I was writing an alphabet book. My very first book, this is how I did it. This is really my writing process. And I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry I don't have it on the computer. But there it is right there. I wrote one through 26, but the book is 32 pages long. Nowadays, I write one through 32, and then I try to fill in. Now that might look like I did it in 10 minutes, it looks like I did it in 10 minutes. I might have worked on this for six, seven months, my list of what I was going to do for the book. So that's what I did. I thought of the book. I researched the book. And kids, um, teachers, 
you know, like here's some of the books I would use to research the books. Like, look at this book I found in remainder some one day, a book of all the animals in the world, an encyclopedia of animals. Every classroom, I think, should have that book. Every animal you could think of. So I would look through that if I was looking for certain animals for my book, you know? I would look anywhere. I would go to zoos, I would go to museums, I would talk to scientists, I would do anything. So I'm researching the book, researching the book. One day I thought, hey, I gotta put a migrating animal in one of my books. And look, there, yeah, I found a book of migrating, I found a book of migrating animals. So you get the idea, I'm researching the book. After I research the book, I, I start writing the book. And after I'm writing it and I feel pretty good about it, I would uh, hire an illustrator to draw the pictures. If I drew the pictures, the book would be terrible. So I got someone good to draw the pictures for me. Then I would design the book and lay the book out. So that's, that's the process I would use. Recently, I did write a book of, of short stories. It's right here. I wrote a book of short stories called Ocean Cousins. Uh-oh, what happened? I wrote a book of short stories called Ocean Cousins. There we go. It's a little different. Um, you know, it's not 32 pages long. My other 99 books are 32 pages long. And um, when I was working on that, I wanted to show the kids that I didn't just write it in a second. There's some of my stuff that I wrote. So to write 30 short stories in that book, I wrote all this stuff, you know? And if I could find one of the pages, I thought I would show you the process I did. So I wrote it by hand and then I typed it and I got it on the computer. And then after I did that, I, I'm a little disorganized. I probably won't find it. I started, I started editing it and working on it and editing it and working on it and rewriting it and rewriting it and retyping it and retyping it. So it might not look it, but I worked on that book for 11 years. So there's a, um, not really a chapter book, not a novel, but a book of short stories. So for all my fans out there that write, that love the Who Would Win books, I wanted to tell you that tomorrow's my birthday, and look what I got from in the mail today for my birthday. Someone made this hat and sent it to me. <laughs> How do you like that? Yeah, if you're nice to me, I'll give you a Who Would Win hat. Roland, if you're nice to me, I'll get you a Who Would Win hat. So uh, there you go. So here's a Who Would Win book I was working on. And I talked about this the other day. I start like that. There's 32 pages. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to get used to this camera. Yeah, there's 32 pages. So you can see right here, when I first started to write it, I was laying out what I thought. Bull shark against basking shark. Uh, the bull shark wins. Uh, saw shark. Whoops. Saw shark versus um, Mako Shark, the Mako Shark wins. So it looks like I did this, once again, it looks like I did it in 10 minutes. I worked on this for months. How can I get this pagination? And once I got the, the sharks that I wanted and I did all the research and everything, I started writing the book. So just like some other guys, I wrote it by hand. So there's the book, actually the book when I was writing it. And so I didn't type it yet. I was writing it like that. And then you know that the books are full of facts. So besides writing about the sharks that were in the book, the books are full of facts. So like here's a page where I was just writing facts. No, nope, that's not it. Here's a page, I see all the facts. I, I said to myself, I gotta get this fact in the book. I gotta get this fact in the book. I gotta get that fact in the book. So there you go. There's my writing process. So. Um, eventually it's all written and I sent it to my editor, it gets edited, the illustrator starts drawing the pictures. Sometimes I have the illustrator draw some of the pictures first so I can get a feel for what the book would look like. And um, I would say, that's me. There you go. There's my writing process. Um, when I think of a really cool subject, I think, how could I present it to the kids to get them to read it? Like my thing is, first of all, how can I get boys to read? How can I get girls to read that don't like to read? How can I get boys that don't like to read to read? And I think 
how should I lay out the book to keep their attention? How can I write the book to keep their attention? And how can I fill the book full of facts so they keep learning and learning and learning? Okay, I'm giving it over to you guys. Roland. Okay, I'm ready to go. Thank you, Jerry. That was I really hope I spoke long enough. Oh, it was great. I'm gonna write a picture book. I'm gonna try. Um, I think you'll see a lot of similar similarities in all of our uh, techniques. This is like so interesting to me. But when I was uh, when I write a book, I try to create a reader because I was a reader when I was a kid, and that's what turned me into an author and a bunch of other things. And so that's always kind of at the back of my mind. And I'm going to switch here to a little PowerPoint show. I hope. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Okay, you got to tell me if this is on. Am I on? Yes. My yeah. screen is on. Okay, great. Um, and when I grew up um, trying to become an author, I became a, a research biologist. So research is really, really important to me. And it takes me usually twice as long to do the research for a book as it does to write the book. And I don't start writing the book until I finish the research. Mm -hmm. So the book on top there up here is a, a novel I wrote called Jaguar. It takes place in uh, Brazil. It's about uh, a guy who's uh, setting up a uh, Jaguar preserve with his son. And these are some of the books I had to read in order to write Jaguar. So even though I've been to South America a couple times and, and know a lot about Brazil, know a lot about tropical rainforest, that really doesn't mean that I'm qualified to write a book about that subject. And so in order to get that out, I have to read a lot of books. And so I read a lot of books and uh, I look at uh, maps. I write what's called realistic fiction. It means most of the places I write about, you can actually go there. I mean, it, they're pretty much the same way they are. If you were to go there, you could look them up on a map and visit yourself someday. The other thing I do is I look at photographs. Um, I've been on assignment for National Geographic a couple times and um, I'm, a, I'm a visual writer. What a lot of people say about my books is they read my books and they go, it played like a movie in my head. And that's, that's exactly right. Cause I write visually. A lot of you out there are also visual, probably 90% of you are vi visual. It means when you see something that stimulates your imagination. So if you don't know what to write about, look at photographs. And when you look at a photograph and you, you see one that strikes you, then uh, use it to make up a story. Every time I see something, hear something, think of something, read something that I might want to put in my book, I make a note of it on a three by five card. I have this big box in my office and I think of an idea, I jot it down and I throw it in the box and I forget about it for the time being. Um, I wrote a novel called Thunder Cave. So if these are the Thunder Cave cards. That was my first novel. There'd be things about elephants. There'd be things about Jake Lanson, the main character in the book. There'd be things about the Maasai people, little bits of information. When I have a box full of cards filled out, I dump those cards out on the floor and I sort through them and I decide what little bits of information I'm going to put in my book and what little bits of information I'm not going to put in my book. After that's done, I'm, I'm not quite ready to write. Um, and let me kind of explain this a little bit. The first three novels I wrote, I used this technique I'm going to talk about. I don't so much use it anymore because um, one thing you get a little bit better at is better at is holding a complete story in your head. But writing a novel the first time around, the first couple times around, is really, really daunting. I mean, you start out really good and you might write a couple pages and then you just don't know what to do. And that happened to me for many, many years. I mean, I had what I thought were really good ideas and I'd sit down and I'd start writing and then it would just sort of the writing would kind of peter out and I just go I don't know what to do but in the film industry when they make movies before they make a movie they do a thing called a storyboard and what that means is that someone comes into the studio and they uh, basically draw a cartoon of every single scene in that movie scene by scene by scene so they know how the, how they should film it and how the story is going to flow I don't draw really well so what I do uh, on storyboards is I write down what I think is going to happen in my story. So if this, this, this storyboard was Thunder Cave, that first novel I wrote, that first card would say, Jake Lanza riding his mountain bike in New York City. I go, great, that's a good scene. What's next? The second card would uh, say that Jake Lanza goes home and gets terrible, terrible news. And the third card I'm putting up would say, Jake Lanza goes to the hospital. So I work through the story 
scene by scene by scene as best as I can. And when I'm done, look how happy I am. This is what a, a, a novel looks like on a storyboard. For you kids out there watching, uh, you probably don't have to do a storyboard this big at first. You might be able to get away with five or six of these little yellow cards, but just write down one scene after another scene and then put them in order in the way you think they should go, kind of like you're watching a movie in your head. And when you start writing, all you have to do is follow the cards, meaning you look at the card and you go, now how would I write that first scene with Jake Lanza riding his bike in New York City and write that, then write the second one, the third one and fourth one or whenever you get to the end of your yellow cards. Now, like Jerry, um, I write a lot of my books by hand. So this is a typical notebook that I have that I work, uh, work on. I, I'll show you something a little bit later because I do work a little differently sometimes. Um, and I work, I like working by hand because it's not distracting. I think computers are wonderful, um, but I also think there's a lot of things to do on computers that kind of take you out of the moment. But when you're working on a piece of paper with a pencil or a pen, uh, there's no email, there's no social, you know, networking, there's none of that stuff. There's just you and the story. And, and in a way this helps me to concentrate. So I fill up this notebook. I think I have a video of it here. Here we go. And by the way, I don't write this fast as time lapse. I wish I did write this fast. Mm -hmm. Once I have a notebook filled out, I take the words that I've handwritten in the notebook and I type them into a computer because it's much easier to revise in a computer. And uh, this is a typical uh, revised page. See this page? Took me maybe a half an hour to write this page. What did I do when I was revising it? I crossed out everything. So for the last sentence at the bottom, isn't that sad? Most of my books in rough draft are probably mm, 80,000 words. When you read my books, they're 50,000 words. So I cut out like 30,000 words of every single story I, I write. It doesn't mean that those words are bad or junk. It just means that they don't really fit the story I'm, I'm writing. Once I have it perfect, and by that I mean I've revised it dozens and dozens and dozens of times, I think it's pretty good at that point, I send it to a publisher and, it, and a publisher goes to an editor. And you kind of hope that they call you and say, Roland, you're a genius. <laughs> we didn't make one change in your book. Well, that's not really how it works. Here's what happens. So you wait, you wait about a month or six weeks and you're, you're excited to have your book come back and, and get all this praise and stuff. And this is really what comes back. Every page looks just like this, mm -hmm. every single page. And I'll be honest, when you look at this, you go, give me a break. Are you kidding me? And, but then you read the little notes here on the side and they kind of explain what they did or what they would like to have you do. And you go, oh, that's a good point. And I make changes. The thing you need to know about changes is I don't really have to change anything. It's not quite like homework. It's, it's different. I'm Roland Smith and I don't have to change a lot of things um, if I don't want to. Um, but about 99% of the time when I read the little notes here on the side, I think, oh yeah, 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 that's a better idea. So we really rely on editors to actually, I rely on editor to make me look better than I actually really am. And so I think it's, it's really important. I know a lot of you out there probably go, no, I wrote this thing and I don't want to revise it again. It's done. That is not how writing works. The secret to writing is that writing is revision. That's what writing is all about. We all have to revise. I do it dozens of times. Then I send it in. I think it's pretty good. And then I revise it again a half a dozen times to make it better and better and better and better before you get a chance to read it. So that so that's that's basically my writing process. Let me try to get, well, I guess I am back on. Am I off up in the share screen? There we go. And uh, that's what I do. I mean, that's, that's how I write a book. And, and I, I would like to say this, I think anybody can write a book. I, I do not think that writers are born. I think they're, they're, they're made, you know, I mean, artists might be a little bit different. Um, but, but for a writer, anybody out there who wants to write a book, you can do it. The only thing you need to know is it takes a lot of time to get good enough to where someone will pay you to do it. It takes a lot of practice, like everything. Um, the more you practice, the luckier you get. And, uh, Lucky for me, I mean, I, I learned very, very slowly. It took me many, many years to get good enough to be a writer. Um, but if you knew me and you would understand that if I can write a book, you certainly can write a book. And now I think Jack's gonna go and Jack is wonderful. He's gonna have this really good technique and um, I'm looking forward to this, Jack. Uh, thank you, Roland. Um, I, I have to say that, uh, yeah. what's that? Oh. Can I interrupt you for one second? 
Oh, help yourself. Because we're all friends, right? There was something I forgot that I wanted to show. Can I do that? Oh yeah, jump in. I, I call myself a scrap writer. Like see, there's one of my phone bills and there's some notes that I wrote that ended up, oops, sorry, that ended up in a book, right? Yeah. So I'm a scrap writer. I wrote that on the plane. And then there is some stuff that I wrote. Whoa, sorry guys. There's some stuff that I wrote on a scrap of paper, on a phone bill, on another plane ticket. So kids, keep your pen in your pocket. And whenever you think of something, write it down. Sorry to interrupt you, Jack. It's okay. It's okay. I think Tolstoy had the same thing. Um, okay. So here's what I'm thinking, uh, Jerry. Um, I just want to start off, uh, and for anyone who's watching, just uh, making this one statement, and then we'll dive into things. First off, um, when thinking about writing a book, whether it's a picture book, whether it's a short story, or whether it's a novel, you are always going to be working with the same primary tools and the same elements of writing. For instance, you're going to have characters every time. You're going to have some sort of setting or environment that they're going to be in. There's generally going to be some kind of problem and that's going to be the beginning. And then you're going to move into the middle of that book. Now, in order to unfold that problem and find a solution, you have to illustrate the problem, not just once, not just twice, but at least three times, the rule of three. So when Joey Pigza is out of control, he's not out of control once or twice. It has to be three. When Rotten Ralph is rotten, he's not just rotten once. He's rotten many times. So the middle, when you are saying this is the problem, you have to illustrate that problem. And the rule of three comes in and it leads to what we call the crisis. And that is when we've gone too far, where well, Ralph has gone too far, Joey's gone too far, Jack Henry's gone too far. And then from there, we have some sort of resolution. And of course, at the end of a book, you have not one perfect ending, you always have two perfect endings. You have the physical ending, what has happened, how we solve the problem. And you also have the emotional ending. So that at the end of the book, not only have you written about what has happened, you've written about how the character feels. And when you look at a book, and let's say you rip the book apart, about 50% of that book is action, and 50% is emotion within the character. So you have the exterior and the interior, the elements of writing. So that's just where we start. That's just what I'm arriving at. When I, when I get ready to write a book. So let me see if I can share my screen and give you more of an illustration of this. Well, I didn't want that now, did I? Let's see, do I want that? No, I don't seem to want that. Oh, pardon me. I guess I do want that. Ah, there I am. Oh, yes. Now that's the problem before we have a solution. I'm sorry. No. All right. I, I, miss, I'm, I can't seem to move off of this. Ah, there we are. Okay. So now this book, Writing Radar. So I wrote this book uh, recently, and this book doesn't really talk about novels. It doesn't talk about picture books. It just talks about short story. And really this book is dedicated to writing about what you know about. So when you're young, what you're thinking is, what should I write about? And my answer to that question is write about yourself. Remember, it's all you all the time. You're the main character in your own life. So there's me. Now, when I was a kid, this is pretty much where I started. Sort of like just a kid, I read books, I had an older sister who was a lot smarter than me, and I was trying to emulate her. 
she got a diary. I wanted a diary. So I begged for one and I got one. So this is my diary. Now you can see it right there. So this is my very first diary. And I loved this diary. And obviously you can see how beat up it is. I took it everywhere with me. And I was always trying to make little notes, always trying to come up with story ideas, clever lines. And I was paying attention to the world around me because when you have a diary, you're constantly looking for content, what to write. And so you're constantly paying attention to everything. And you become aware of this heightened state of existence, this real exhilaration within you. You're looking at everybody. You're listening to how they talk. You look at how they're dressed. You look at their, their gestures. And you're taking all of this in. And before long, you find yourself detailing out everything interesting. Now, part of the problem I had with the diary was that I knew how to find interesting details, but I did not know exactly what to do with them. So in my diary, I was having some problems, but I was the uh, library helper at school. And so I'd go to school every morning and I'd shelve books. And I was shelving this book, Harriet the Spy. And I noticed a little girl has a journal. And I was like, whoa, what's she doing with a journal? I'm not doing too much. I'm smart, but I don't know exactly what to do. So maybe I should read this book and I'll get some tips from her. So I read Harriet the Spy. It was like the best book I'd ever read. All she did was basically this. First off, she spied on everybody. She overheard everyone's conversation, wrote it down. She peeked in people's windows, watched what was going on, wrote it down. She hid in people's houses and followed them around and wrote it down. I'm like, whoa, I love that. You know, I love other people's business. And in fact, when you're a writer, other people's business is your business. There's no such thing as being too snoopy. There's one thing though, don't let people catch you at it. Now, so I went back to the library and I stuck my hand between a row of books. It was George on one side and Galdone on the other. Now Gantos would go right in the middle. So I went over alphabetically and I stuck my hand between those books. And I promised myself, I said, Jack, someday you're going to write a book and it's going to go right here. And then I said, who do you think you're kidding? You haven't written a word hardly. So I thought, well, get busy. So I went outside and I thought, okay, practice the Harriet the Spy method. So I put that journal in that bicycle basket right there. That's my dad's Packard clipper and my bicycle basket. And... I drew a spy map of my neighborhood. So I thought, okay, if I can see it, if I can draw it and see it, I can focus on it. So this is my house down on the bottom where it says Gantos, okay? To the right of it is Pagoda. Now, if you are blessed in life, you will grow up living next to the low supervision family in the neighborhood. I love these people. First off, I don't know, kids, if you'll remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we were in South Florida, 90 miles away from nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. So Mr. Pagoda would get up on his roof, and he painted an atomic bomb target on his roof. And he stood up there one day yelling, come on, Mr. Castro, if you're any man at all, send a nuclear-tipped missile over here, I dare you. And I thought, that is so provocative. So I wrote that down. And then... They had a swimming pool back there and they had the best juvenile delinquent son, Gary Pagoda. Gary Pagoda was great. He walked around all day, all day long around his yard just in his underwear with a big knife. And he was sharpening it all day long. And then at night, he would play this little game. He would put diesel fuel on the swimming pool pour a five gallon bucket and set it on fire. And then he would dive into the pool and he'd dare everybody else to come in. I used to dive in there. Don't tell my parents. Back over to my house. You go, well, what's going on at my house? See that dog in the backyard? An alligator came out of the canal and ate him. So I wrote about that. 
See that little spot? I'll get to that. That's my sister's room. That's my bike. My dad ran that over. Mr. Bellucci built a boat, took a year. He launched the boat. That boat sank in about 15 minutes. It was amazing. It was one of those amazing moments when the boat was sinking, his face was sinking at the same pace. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's magnificent. And I remember writing that down. Can he deal a lot like Joey Pigza? See this airplane? Two airplanes up in the sky. My little brother's standing on the front yard with the imaginary finger gun. He's going like this, bang, 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 bang. And he goes, bang. And those planes collided, boom, right above our house. One came screaming down at our yard, missed our house, and boom, blew up right in the yard, right over there. And when it blew up, this big ball of flame went up in the air. And my little brother looked at his finger, scream bloody murder. And he ran in the house and hid under the bed. That kid thought he shot that plane down with his finger. Of course, I was so helpful. I went on in there and I looked under the bed. And I said, Pete, do you hear those sirens? Because the police were coming. He said, yes. I said, they're coming to take you away. And I was just like, yes, older brother crushes younger brother. Grumpy old people in Florida, you had millions of them. You know what they were? Retired school teachers, sorry. And then over here, the M&M family, don't do this to your kids because it's just bad. Their last name's Metric, seven kids. Michael Metric, Megan Metric, Marshall Metric, Michelle Metric, we caught on. They all had the same initials, M-M. So we called them the M&Ms, plain and peanut too, melt in your mouth, not in your hand. And then we lined them up one day and gave them all M&M color names, green M&M, yellow M&M, orange M&M, brown M&M. We just knock on the door and go, hello, Mrs. Eminem, can Orange come out and play? And she just rolled her eyes. Orange, your nutty friends here. So this was the first moment in my life that I thought, Eureka, I do have something to write about. And it was because of the math. You know that wonderful feeling? Seeing is believing. And that's what we're doing. Like when Roland's talking about laying out his book and you can see it and you can really believe in it. When Jerry is scrapping and he's getting all the scraps all piled up and they begin to make sense, you see it, you begin to believe in it. So start here, then do this. Now, not everybody knows their entire neighborhood, but you do know your house. And these days, because we live in this time of this pandemic, you don't want to go through the whole neighborhood. You want to stay closer to home. So you have your house. So get a big sheet of paper, draw your house, draw all the rooms. Dining room table is very important. And see there's Zippy the roach, my little roach friend. And that's where I threw up on the wall. And that's where the dog bit me. And that's where my bike was run over. And that's where I found the watch. And that's where I ripped the wart off of the pair of pliers. And that's where I broke my brother's arm. So I have on this little map, at least a dozen stories. I haven't written them but I know they're there. And I know that if I give them enough thought, I'll get them. Then, once you do this, and now don't do this because some students do this and this will not help you. And that is when I say draw a map, I mean a real map, a lot of details. But some students just get a sheet of paper, they draw a line, a square, something that looks like a piece of distressed broccoli and a stick figure. And then they put their pencil down and I go, what is that? And they go, that's my pathetic little life. I only stick figure under a piece of broccoli next to a square. Nothing interesting ever happens to me. And I'm like, yes, you are a tabula rasa, but you're better than that. Come on, follow me. So action and emotion. Remember I said 50% of a story is action, 50% is emotion. So on this side, we need to brainstorm like brothers, sisters, parents, pets, dumb stuff. Now, you know so much Action takes place with dumb stuff. Secrets, disasters are all about action. Uh, lying, finding stuff, public humiliation, that's a lot of action. School, friends, on the other side. Now here, let me just tell, tell you one thing. Some people love to start a story with action. And some people are totally overwhelmed and taken and inspired by starting with emotion. So you can start with either side. So if you've ever felt confused, that might be an entry point. Proud, curious, bored, love, jealous, panicked. Who doesn't have a panic story? Of course you do. Trusting, awkward, brave, accomplished. Of course you've been accomplished. Now, 
You get this in your journal. So you've got your map, you've got this, and now do this. Take that same map with all the action, and now you add a key emotional word. So when I found that watch, it proved my immaturity in a, in a wild way. So now I have action and emotion. When I ripped that wart out with a pair of pliers, I had action and emotion. It hurt and I felt really stupid. When I dropped Zippy the roach, I had this little roach friend and my sister was sleeping on the couch and I dropped the roach in her open mouth. And she said, I'm gonna tell mom and she's gonna kill you. And I said, okay, I'll do anything. She said, okay, take off all your clothes and run naked around the outside of the house. I said, okay. So I took off all my clothes and I ran outside and she locked every door and every window and I died in the bushes all day. So until my father came home and I jumped out naked in front of the car. So what we want to do at this point is now get our heads really geared up. So we see the action, we have the emotion, now you're ready to write. Now, once you start writing, and your writing is gonna look a lot, you know, it's, it's messy, it looks like Jerry's, it looks like Roland, Roland's got great handwriting. And, you know, mine's pretty messy too. I'm not gonna pull all this stuff out. But once you get that first draft, you know, you write and write and write and write and write and write and write, and then you go, okay, I think this story is exhausted, but it's a mess then you don't have to worry because you've got the elements of writing to back you up. Beginning of the story, beginning, middle, end. Beginning, character setting, problem. Got it. Action crisis, that's about half of your story right there. Remember that rule of three. Three actions really illustrate the problem. And then resolution, solve the problem that you've illustrated in the action, and then that double ending, physical ending and emotional ending. Now you've got a great second draft. You're, all of your material is not polished, but it's in the correct order. And then a little polishing. Well, one is point of view. Well, you get that one automatically. The point of view for you is first person point of view. I said, I did, I am. You are the boss of that story. Structure, we applied that structure, beginning, middle, end, and all the elements. Physical action. Now I want you to read your story just like you're seeing a movie. And you want to make sure that the reader can see line by line everything you see. Once you get to the end, drop down. Now you braid in the emotion with the action. And that goes through. That is the central core of your story that action and emotion right there. Those two drafts are essential. Then you say to yourself, hey, am I on task? What's this story about anyway? That speaks to the theme. Oh yes, I am on task. Dialogue, make your characters speak. When your characters speak, they pop alive and they become three dimensional. That's what you want in a good character. And then descriptions and right words, show off that brilliant vocabulary you have. Do not hold back, let it rip and really show off your writing strengths. And then you review everything that you've done, and then you rake out at the very end all those useless words, all those extra ands, if, but, so's, really, and that word like, which gets in there, at least 50% too much. You rake those out, you kick them to the curb, and then your story instantly goes from dear diary diary to good, better, better, best. Then, you put your name on it, and that's a piece of literature. And you're like, yeah, that's a good one. And then you go right back to the beginning again. You go to your map, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a good one. I remember that. And remember, the more blood in a story, the better it's going to be. OK, now, how do I get back? I'm not sure how I get back. Oh, at the top yeah. of your screen in green. Oh, it, there it is. Look at that. Um, stop share. Ha! Huh, there you, you go. We're all back. Well, thank you, Jack. That was great, Jack, as always. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Beautiful. We have a bunch of questions. Oh, let's do them. Some of those. 
Here's, a, here's an interesting question. I, I don't know, maybe just start at the top. I don't know, I'll stop here. It says, uh, gentlemen, that's us. Oh. Yeah. Are, are there digital tools you now use to help with your writing process? For example, Roland, perhaps an app for your storyboard layout. Um, there are a lot of them. I've used a lot of them. Honestly, I'd rather do it by hand. I, I just, again, computers are kind of distracting for me. And um, I, I like them. I mean, I think they're great. They're certainly really valuable and stuff. But I really like Gary, like Jerry, like it's kind of scrap writing. I like the physical writing a note down by hand and putting that up. I mean, that's just me, but there certainly are digital things you can use. Um, this is for you, you, Jack and Jerry. What suggestions do you have for applying the map approach in writing picture books for young readers? Um, I'll just tell you what I, what I do. Um, because, you know, we didn't get, I didn't get into picture book, I didn't get in the novel, but all those elements of writing will be inside a picture book. So as Jerry was pointing out, when he was showing that piece of cardboard with the little pages on it, so sometimes I just draw a grid, a big grid, and I put 16 squares on it. Now I know when I write a picture book, I'm just doing half of the book. The illustrator is going to do the other half. So it's writing, picture, writing, picture. The books are generally about 32 pages long. So I draw a big square, grid it out, 16 pages, four pages for the beginning, eight pages for the middle, and four pages for the end. The elements of writing I showed earlier, they all fit inside that grid perfectly. Well, this is kind of related to that too. There's another question about picture books. It says, our picture works always 32 pages long. Uh, about 99% of them are 32 pages long. So books are in fours, because think about it. Sheet into the binding, sheet out. One, two, three, four. So books are in fours. So to print a 32 page book is easy to fold, hold. So that's like the standard. So if you add one page, you can't add one page because the other side of the page is another page. So you can add two pages, but then you don't, you, you don't have a way to bind it through the binding. So books are in fours. You could go 32, 36, 40, 42, but 32 is the easiest, the most economical. Almost all picture books are 32 pages long. Yeah. Um, they used to be uh, 48 in 19. 19- yes, when I read Rotten Ralph, it was 48 pages long. Yeah. yeah. And, and then what happened is the price of printing went up and the price of paper went up. So they were sick, those books all, were all $6.95. And then as the price of the cost of the book went up, they started shrinking the size of the book to try and maintain that $6.95 and never could. But they can't shrink it too far. No, they can't. Because then they can't put a binding on it. That's so right. 32 is like the perfect size. That's the golden size right there. This is for you, Jerry. You ready? Yeah. Who would win? The only book that, oh no, we got a five-star review from one of my boys. And here's another one for you, Jerry. Uh, let's see. Where was that thing? Hang on. He said, someone said, happy birthday. 67. 67. But you're just a baby. You're just a baby. Someone else said, uh, who would win, Jerry? Age or beauty? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a bloodbath. I'm going to answer that. OK, this is a good question. Um, when you get a story idea, do you ever worry that there are already books on the subject in print? And how can you make sure you're writing something original? Um, well, I think, I, 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 think, I think if you put up a storyboard and you had 32 kids right off that storyboard, you'd end up with 32 books because everybody sees things a little bit differently and stuff. And so for me personally, I don't really worry too much. I mean, I do look it up and sort of see what's been done. If somebody's done a really good job and it's exactly like the book I wanted to write, I may not go with it. I'll just recommend that book. It's a lot easier to recommend a book than it is the right one if it's a really great book. Um, but for me, there, there really is nothing new under the sun. That's a, you know, 
trite phrase, but it's really, really true. Basically, lots of things have been written about. If you search enough, you're going to find a book about the same idea you're writing, but you're going to bring your own self into that book. And it's going to be different because you're telling that story, not Jack or Jerry or me or somebody else. Any other ideas about that? You guys? I could tell a story. I went to Antarctica. I saw a baby elephant seal. I saw a baby fur seal. I saw a baby penguins. And I came home and I said, I want to write a book of baby chicks. And, and, uh, my editor showed me like 25 books of baby Antarctic bird chicks. And I said, mm, I guess I'm not going to do that. It's been done 25 times, mm -hmm. but you know, there are ideas that haven't been done. I think like I've never seen a spice and flavor book. So I wrote a spice and flavor book. I've never seen a book of skulls. So I wrote a skull book, you know, a children's skull book. I've never seen a book of eyeballs. So I wrote an eyeball outfit book. So I am looking for, I call it open space, you know, I am looking for, you know, ideas, you know, that haven't been done before in children's literature. So to be creative is really, you know, difficult. So there you go. There's my stories. What do you think, Jack? Um, well, since, since I, Roland, I, I so often write autobiographical fiction that uh, it's all me all the time and it's unique, you know, the, the world is uniquely filtered through every individual. Yeah. So I'm not really hey. concerned about it. And I always find that if I'm interested in it, that's what I'm gonna do. I don't yeah. care if somebody else did another book on it. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I, can give, I can give an example. When I wrote, when I was writing Peak, uh, Gordon Corman came out with a three book series called Everest. And I, I love Gordon, he's a good friend and I, he writes really well. And I went, oh no. So I'm working on Peak and I read the book and his books and I thought they were just really great. But he had a real different angle on what he was doing. I mean, I told him, I was telling a very different story uh, about climbing on Everest from kind of my viewpoint. And he wrote the book from his viewpoint. And even though it takes place in the same, basically around the same time with climbers and so forth, they, I don't think they ever co collided with each other. They're both great, great series. And they, I don't think they sort of, they're really in competition because they were written, like you said, by different people mm -hmm. from a different viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, people uh, people get sort of hung up on that uh, frequently. They yeah. think, oh, somebody else has already done that. And there's nothing left for me for me to do. But no, the, the fact is you're, you're unique. You're always going to bring something unique to it. There's stuff. There's tons of stuff left to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's for you, Jerry. It says, how do you yeah. look for open space for new books, book ideas in your daily life? Uh, I just try to think of anything. I go to. I visit a lot of schools. I see a lot of books on the shelves. I talk to a lot of kids. I just think, have I ever seen this? Have I ever seen that? Have I ever seen this? Like I wrote a book of crabs, crab outfit book. I don't think I've seen much on crabs really. So I thought I'm gonna do a crab book. I wrote a book on moths. I've never seen a moth book for children. I wrote a book on moths. And there's, there's thousands of butterfly books. Somehow the moths got ignored and I thought I'm gonna write a moth book, you know? So um, um, I don't know if that answers his question. Tell me the question again. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Do you look for open space for new book ideas in your daily life? Yes. When I'm walking around, I'm always thinking. I'm always thinking. When I'm at red lights, I'm always thinking. When I talk to kids, when I visit schools, when I go out on the boat, I'm always thinking of book ideas. It's hard, it's hard to turn your head off. It's hard to turn your brain. It's hard to turn your brain off when your brain's working. Yep. Yep. Uh, let me look just real quick here. This is a question I don't quite understand, but but maybe you guys do. It says digital books don't have fours, the number four. That's fours, true. Course. That's true when it comes but to. You, but do you think the structure you are talking about will remain important into the future in organizing great books? I would say yes, because the print books, uh, I thought about that. When you introduce digital books, there's no limit. The children's book could be as long as you want or as short as you want. 
whereas when you print them, you have to, you, you can't do everything. It's too expensive. Yeah. You know, you could have an eight page book when it's digital. You could have a 500 page children's book when it's digital, you know? So yeah, I have thought of that. And I thought it would affect it faster than it has, but I don't think it's really affected it. If you look at the country, people haven't really embraced color picture books digitally, you know, novels they have, you know, I've heard that famous writers, their novels are like 70% eBooks right now, but like children's books, it's, it's, it's like less than 2% maybe a book mm -hmm. spot. I mean, the other day I got 36 cents for the ebook sales of one of my books. So mm -hmm. it shows you that nobody's really buying ebooks. Yeah. It's it's hard to digest them with the the formatting with the the text and the and the picture sometimes, um, and also you're dealing with a, a a younger child and I and I I think the tactile nature of the book, the turning of the page, the the exiting one thought and entering another thought, um, is is just beautiful. And I think the book itself is beautiful. And the yeah. fact that you have it, and that once your parent leaves the room and they say, go to sleep, you don't turn on the computer again and read that book. You just pull it out from under your pillow and read that book. Yeah. And then you can take it in the car. <laughs> you know, so the so book, book has its fabulous usefulness. Yeah. Here's another one. How mm -hmm. important is attempting impacting the world and in particular the lives of children when you're thinking about your next book idea. I missed the beginning of it. How important is attempting impacting the world and in particular the lives of children when you are thinking about your next book idea? Um, I, I, I would have to say that really speaks to the, the theme of the book or the message a little bit of the book. In, like in the Norbelt book, Miss Volker is always saying, you know, if you don't know your history, anybody can lie to you and call it the truth. And that, and that becomes a thematic line that runs through the, the core of that book. The book I'm writing now that I started about six months ago, that book is, um, the core of that book is helping out it's 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 helping out you know the pandemic came along but but nonetheless uh helping out would then be really the 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 i would say the bolus or the you know the central core of that book i like to make sure that i do have a theme that i can come back to a cave to come back to and uh and so i like that to be set it is important how about you jerry I missed the first word of that question. How important is the is attempting impacting oh, the world. attempting attempting impacting world? Yeah, like how important is impacting the world important to you when you write a book? Well, I wouldn't want to encourage violence, and I wouldn't want to encourage kids to misbehave anyway when I was writing my books, and. Uh, I, I think I would talk about the beauty of the animals and all the books I wrote that are that are have nature animals in them. And, uh, you know, like say my moth book, it's so beautiful to look at. I think it's like a celebration of nature. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to encourage kids to be mean to them. You know what I mean? So I guess that's always in the back of my mind to be to have, send out a positive attitude. Now, in some of my books, like the Who Would Win books, they fight, but that that's the truth in nature, you know, that the jaguar eats a lizard or something like that. So, um, but I wouldn't, I try to celebrate the animals. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I mean, for me, I'm just trying to write a, a story I think people will like, but you can't help but Put yourself into that book. I write a lot of environmental eco thriller books, and of course, like you, Jerry, it's all about nature. It's about what to do and why you should appreciate it, why it's important, and so forth. But I think it's 
important for those who are out there trying to write. One thing you don't want to do in any of your books, I think, is become preachy, which means you don't want to really teach. You don't want to write a book because you want to teach people a lesson. That's that's not, I mean, unless you're writing nonfiction. I mean, when you write a novel, you're writing a story, and that's not necessarily- I think I would lose my readers if I got preachy. Yeah, so you, so you got to be careful, even though you feel strongly about something, that you don't get too preachy. Let that let people make up their own mind. Just tell the story and let them make up their mind about it. What do you think yeah. about that, Jack? I mean, you you do that. You just tell a story, and there's a lot of uh, moral lessons in the book or whatever. But it's just a natural part of the story. I mean, it just yeah, it is a natural part of the story, and and a lot of times you try you you couch it. You know, you don't want to always be the theme from the narrative point of view. You want the theme to come through the characters. You know, they carry, they carry that message and you yeah. can back, you know, you don't have to have that heavy hand, you know, because if the characters don't feel it anyway, the reader's not going to feel it. So it's just not a great thing to have your narrator be so dang high and mighty and, you know, always bound in the theme. Nobody cares for that. Yeah. I guess we should uh, wrap this up. Yeah. I know there's a lot more questions, but we can't be here forever. Um, so do, do either of you, Jerry... Jack, have anything to say before we go? And uh, I'm, I can't remember what we're doing tomorrow. I guess well, I do have one thing about tomorrow. I think tomorrow is the story behind the story. Oh, that's right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and so we're going to give some. Uh, we're going to open some doors, some insightful doors into the the why and the how. Yep. Jerry, anything? Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the ladies, uh, Jamie and Mary Alice in behind the scenes helping us. Thank you. And um, thank you, Roland. It's a joy to be with you. Thank you, Jack. It's a joy to be with you. I'm a lucky guy meeting great authors like you. And all you kids and teachers and parents that watched, thanks for tuning in. We hope to keep doing this. Yeah. Thank great, you. everybody. This is great. Thanks. We'll be back uh, Thursday and Friday. It's been a lot of fun for us. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Thursday and Friday. And yeah, it gets better sad, every time. I'll be sad next week when we're not doing this. So, this is and as a reminder, how long have you been on the road together? Going on 10,000 schools. How many? 100 years. 10,000 schools. Long time. At least 90 years between us of visiting schools. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Well, you know, Jamie, for both of us, it's just been an absolute joy to be a part of this and be behind the scenes. So thank you to everybody that's watching us. Um, and for tomorrow, Jamie, you want to give them the. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to continue to share out that the new link that will come every day uh, that will come out shortly. And as long as you subscribe to learning live, you'll get notified of when it is live. So you can always join in at that time. Um, and we also did include all three of their websites in the stream today. So make sure to check them out, connect with them and learn more. So we're ready to rock and roll tomorrow. Thank you guys so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye.